Welcome to the Insightful Professor. Today we will discuss two approaches to defining a primary key for a database table. In one approach, we'll discuss something referred to as a natural key, and in the other approach, we'll discuss something called a surrogate key. Instinctively, when transforming a conceptual model to a logical model, the designer will use a natural key. However, there are times when using a surrogate key may be a better choice. So we'll explain the differences between these types of keys and the benefits one type might have over the other type in certain situations. When building a conceptual model of the application domain, the designer or analyst must determine the relevant entities and relationships present in that domain. By definition, each instance of an entity type must be distinguishable from all other instances of that type. As Peter Chun noted in his work on the entity relationship model, we need some form of an identifier or an identifying attribute which allows us to make such a distinction. In the case of course, in an academic application domain, each course would have a course number, a name, a description, a lab fee, and some number of credits to be awarded to a student who successfully completes the course. How do we identify one particular course? The course number would serve as the identifying attribute, allowing us to distinguish one course from another. Note that sometimes this identifier would not be atomic, consisting of a single value such as course number, but could possibly be composite. So when the conceptual model is ultimately transformed into a logical model, that is a set of tables, the identifying attribute will become the key of the resulting table. It's presented then as a column in that table. There are times when, for practical reasons, we may wish to use something other than what has been identified as the identifying attribute or the identifier within the conceptual model. This is what we want to focus on here. We'll explain the circumstances that might cause us to choose an alternative to the identifying attribute. Let's explain a couple of these terms. We've mentioned natural key. What do we mean by this? When the identifying attribute of the conceptual model becomes the primary key of the table that results from the entity type, we say that this is a natural key. What has happened is during analysis of the application domain, we arrived at the identifying attribute by understanding the application domain ourselves, And we recognize that this identifying attribute has actual meaning to someone who works within that application domain. So the attribute or attributes that serve to identify an entity instance naturally occur within the application domain. It's a natural descriptor. These attributes carry business meaning. This is how the business users, the business community, identifies an entity instance. And each row of the resulting table then is uniquely identified by this natural key. So when an attribute carries a business meaning, the column that represents that attribute or attributes is recognizable to users of the system. So remember that these people are familiar with the application domain and use the terminology we captured in the conceptual model. There are some modelers who strongly believe that the natural key is the only way by which we should identify a row in the table. Now let's turn to the surrogate key. A surrogate key is an artificially produced value 
It's artificial in that it carries no real-world meaning. It's not recognizable by users of the application domain because it doesn't exist within the application domain. It's usually system generated. And it often takes the form of simply an integer. So most often a surrogate key will be generated and subsequently managed by the database system. It's some kind of an incrementing counter whose values may range from one up to some number n, where n would represent what we deem to be the maximum number of rows allowed or anticipated within the table. Some systems support an identity property for a column. You might see this, for example, in Microsoft SQL Server. A sequential number generator is supported by a number of different database systems. This would be called a sequence. This could also be used. There are times when we wish not to use the natural key as the primary key, and we'll explain some of those situations in a moment. And this is why we want to understand the concept of a surrogate key. Some modelers actually swear by the notion of a surrogate key, and others would say, you know, I, I'd die before I would use anything other than a natural key. So obviously there's no consensus as to whether you would use a natural key or a surrogate key. If you scan the literature on data modeling and database design, you'll see there's no conclusive support to go one way or the other. So what we need to do is understand the benefits or the drawbacks of either approach. Because there's a lack of consensus on this within, say, a transaction database system, an OLTP system, versus a data warehouse, we have to wrestle with the question as to which type of primary key is better. Let's review some of the characteristics or properties of a primary key. First, we define the term candidate key. By candidate key, we mean this is an attribute or combination of attributes that uniquely identifies a row in a table or relation. The candidate key has to satisfy two properties. First, unique identification. For every row, the value of the key must uniquely identify that row. And second, non-redundancy. No attribute in the key can be deleted without destroying the property of unique identification. This is also referred to as the principle of minimality. We're looking for the minimum number of attributes that can serve as this unique identifier. The first property implies that each non-key attribute is functionally dependent on the key. Additionally, because a candidate key serves as a method of identification, it follows that a candidate key cannot be null. Ideally, a candidate key for a relation should not change value over time. So we had said that any attribute or combination of attributes that uniquely identifies all of the other attributes in the table qualifies as a candidate key. A little more formal way of phrasing that would be if every field in a table is functionally dependent on some field, call it K, then K is a candidate key. Here we have a table called policy, which contains the attributes of policy number, policy type, name, and address. We note the functional dependencies as saying policy number determines the policy type. Policy number determines the name. And finally, the value of policy number also allows us to identify the address. So we conclude that policy number is a candidate key. Note that there may be situations where more than one candidate key exists 
within a table. In such a case, it's the designer's responsibility to designate one of the candidate keys as the primary key. In our current example for policy, we've only identified one candidate key, hence policy number would be designated as the primary key. Note that there are times when a candidate key is not atomic, that is, it doesn't consist of a single attribute, but it could be composite or compound. Here we have something that we're calling course, which contains course number, section number, instructor, room, and time. The functional dependencies that we've identified from understanding the application domain tell us that it is a combination of course number and section number that will serve to identify the instructor. That same combination of attributes will identify the room, and that same combination of attributes will identify the time, the scheduled a time offering of the course. Thus, the combination of course number and section number can serve as a candidate key, and in this situation being the only candidate key, would become the primary key of the table. Now, with all of the background and the definition of surrogate key and natural key, we could go either way in terms of specifying the primary key, so how do we make our decision? Whether you choose surrogate or natural key depends on the nature of the data itself, the database platform you might be working with, and the group that within the organization wields more power, such as the DBA group, or perhaps it's the application development team. Note that we've mentioned the database platform is one of the influencing factors. What we're doing when we go with a surrogate key is we're not going back and changing the conceptual model. This is actually a decision that is made during physical implementation of the database. Remember, the conceptual model addresses the issue of getting the semantics correct and understanding the application domain. So whatever is termed the identifying attribute within the application domain remains that way. But it's at the time we go to build the database, the physical implementation, that we may choose a different mechanism as the primary key. This is where a surrogate key would appear. So it's not going to cause us to go back and change our conceptual model. So this is why the particular DBMS may have an effect on our choice, whether or not it supports the idea of some kind of capability of an identity property for an attribute, or whether we use a sequence, or whether we kind of have to build it ourselves because the DBMS doesn't support any of those capabilities. So consider when a table is the parent in a parent-child relationship or an entity type with a cardinality of one in a one-to-many relationship. Then it's the key of the parent or the entity type with the one that gets included within the child or the many as a foreign key to capture the relationship. So this means that whatever the primary key might be, the same key will appear as a foreign key in each child instance within this relationship. Thus, when we mention simplifying key structures, we are referring to both the primary key and the foreign key. So let's consider using a surrogate key. We suggest creating a surrogate key if the entity has a natural key and any of the following conditions hold. The natural key could be composite. If the primary key consists of multiple columns, each instance of a foreign key that references this primary key will necessarily also be composite. It will have the same number of corresponding columns. So this could add considerable overhead to the physical storage required 
and it could increase the complexity of queries in the database due to a more complex join condition when we access the parent and the child in a query. Another condition to consider would be the natural key is inefficient. And what do we mean by this? Well, if the natural key is quite large, each instance of a foreign key that references the primary key will also be large. And again, this could add considerable overhead to the physical storage required. Note that the natural key may be atomic, it may be a single value, but it could be a very large character string. Finally, a natural key is recycled. What do we mean for this situation? Well, in some situations, the natural key cannot be guaranteed to be unique over time. Consider something like a telephone number. The individual with some phone number may in the future have that line disconnected. They surrender that number. Because there's a finite number of possible telephone numbers available by the telephone companies to be issued out, it's likely that at some time in the future, that same number will be issued again, but to a different individual. That's the concept of what we mean by recycling. When a surrogate key is created, the natural key is still present in the table. See, the natural key has meaning within the organization, so we don't want to remove it from the database. We're just not going to use it as the identifier. Notice that the natural key could be used for business searches. And furthermore, that natural key, because it was a candidate key, is designated as an alternate key in the database. That means we must define it with a unique constraint and also define it with a not null constraint. Let's go to the database for a moment and demonstrate a couple of the points that we were just talking about. I'm going to examine the Oracle database system. What I've done is I've connected as a database administrator. This allows me to look at the system catalog or the data dictionary views that begin with DBA. And I'm able to look at some of those things that pertain to the physical structure of the database. Here I'm querying a table called DBA table spaces. A table space in an Oracle database is a logical container. When we create tables, we designate the table as being part of or belonging to a particular table space. So each table space is uniquely identified by a table space name. There's a transition between the logical and the physical. So if we go a bit further into the result that I've produced here, what we'll see is in DBA table spaces, I could query the names of all of the table spaces. Here's where we do the transition to something physical. Each table space is associated with one or more operating system files called data files. These data files hold the actual data. Now, the name of an operating system file is referred to in the database as file name. And note that this can be up to 513 bytes. That would be the natural key. And table space in this case is a foreign key because a given table space could have many data files, but a data file will be associated with one table space. File ID, on the other hand, is quite small. It's a simple integer. File ID is a surrogate key. Let's show you what these things look like and then tell you why we have a surrogate key versus using the natural key as the primary key of the table. If I query DBA data files and I look at the file ID and I look at the file name, you can see the file ID is simply an integer, so it's quite small. But the file name in my database, I have up to about 60, 65 characters, but potentially we could have 513 characters. So this is much larger as a key than the simple integer. 
Now, why is this significant? Well, remember, this is the child in this parent-child relationship, so you're not buying into this yet. But this also is a parent in another relationship with our children. When we allocate storage for a database object, such as a table or an index, we use what are called extents. An extent would be some amount of storage allocated from a data file for a particular object. Data for that object goes into the extent. Once the extent is filled, we can get another extent and continue to get more of these and put the data in these additional extents. So associated with a particular object within a file could be many different extents. Let's go a little bit further. And if I look at a view called DBA extents, for each object, such as a table or an index or other objects that require storage, the object has what's called a segment. And that segment is going to contain multiple extents. So now let's see where this comes together. If I query DBA extents for an object called obj$ owned by the user sys, I'm looking as to what table space this resides in, the extents, and the file. As we look at the output of this query, we'll see that there are 25 extents allocated for this thing called obj$ All of these are within the system table space. All of these are within file, which has file ID 9. Remember, this is the surrogate key in DBA data files. It's a foreign key here. So we have something pretty small. The same value appears 25 times. Remember, had we chosen to use the natural key, going back and looking at data file number 9, we have this huge string of text. This string of text would have appeared 25 times in this view here and in this report. So we saved a considerable amount of storage. That's the selling point in terms of the efficiency. We were talking about the idea of composite keys. Here we're talking about inefficient natural key. The natural key potentially is 500 characters we could use simply an integer. That's what we chose to use. In an application that I worked with where I did the data model, I had this concept of an, an inspection that was being performed on a product that was being produced. The inspection required that sample items of what was being produced be examined. So for each inspection, there were multiple pieces or items examined during the inspection. There may have been 5, 10, 20 items being inspected. Those items were recorded in a separate table, a child table. So we needed a foreign key to refer back to the inspection table. It turned out that in this application domain, there were like four or five data items, a composite natural key that would serve to uniquely identify one inspection. Had we chosen to use the natural key as the primary key, then we would have had these same four or five data items appearing as a foreign key for each item that was sampled during the inspection. But we chose to do something similar to what Oracle did here. We created an integer called inspection type and use that as the primary key of the inspection table, a surrogate key, and then used it as a foreign key to capture the relationship. It had a much smaller physical footprint. So those are a couple of examples of where we would be using primary key coming from a natural key or primary key coming from a surrogate key. So I hope that example clears things up for you. So let's summarize what we've talked about. In this video, we examine two types of 
primary keys for a table, a natural key and a surrogate key. Remember, you can only have one primary key. So we had to choose between these. So we discussed situations when a natural key or a surrogate key would be more appropriate. And then we finished up by giving you some real world examples of natural and surrogate keys. So the answer to the question that we raised early on as to when should we use a surrogate key, when should we use a natural key, the answer is very straightforward. It depends. So we suggested those situations where one approach might be more preferable. So if you found this video informative, give us a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel to be notified when we post future videos. And once again, thanks for watching. Thank you.